On the night of July the 20th, 1969, two American astronauts were attempting to do something no human being had ever done before. Roger, Eagle, Sun, Doc. Roger, how does it look? Hey, Eagle has wings. Roger. Neil Armstrong from Ohio and Buzz Aldrin from New Jersey were the two men sent to complete a promise made by President Kennedy at the beginning of the decade. During our descent, Everything looked good approaching the point coming around the moon, except our communication was a little scratchy. Uh, we're going to try it. There's an anxious moment. Don't go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guide. Go. Patrol. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're go for landing. Over. I was in the control center of Houston. Five and four, we're coming down nicely. 200 feet. Four and a half down. Five and a half down. You know, there was some doubt about this clear up to the last. 60 seconds. As to where they were coming in, whether they had enough fuel or not, were they going to be able to land where they knew there was a surface that was going to be reasonably good for them to land on. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. It's a, it's a gee whiz and few, uh, it's a, it's a, yeah, we're down and, and I can remember just uh, looking this way and leaning over and patting Neil on the back and just kind of saying, well, we made it. We copy you down, Eagle. A journey of a quarter million miles. It took 300,000 American workers to make it happen. Now step off the lamb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. 600 million people were watching one-fifth of the entire world's population. We were seeing things that no one had seen before. Stark beauty, it's so pure and it's so perfect. Magnificent desolation. On the Sea of Tranquility, Armstrong and Aldrin left a plaque that read, We came in peace for all mankind. in the summer of 1969, peace and tranquility were merely concepts. At the end of the 60s, America was still haunted by memories of the young president, whose election had ushered in the decade and whose assassination had shattered its optimism. Kennedy's inaugural pledge to pay any price and bear any burden to defend freedom was being severely tested in Vietnam. President Johnson's further escalation of the war had cost him the presidency. And in 1968, Richard Nixon was elected largely on the promise to win peace with honor. To his supporters, that meant an outcome that would further American interests and ideals in the world. To his critics, it meant prolonging the horror. January 20th, 1969, Inauguration Day for the 37th President of the United States.
difficult years, America has suffered from a fever of words. We cannot learn from one another until we stop shouting at one another, until we speak quietly enough so that our words can be heard as well as our voices. There were virtually two Americas when Richard Nixon took office, and they collided that day in the first major disruption of an inaugural ceremony in the history of the Republic. Eggs were thrown. Obscenities were thrown. The placards were out there that were just awful. It, it, we were so torn apart that we couldn't even inaugurate a freely elected president with the dignity and the pomp and circumstance that such an occasion demands. And it was really a terrible low point in American history. What I seen on newspapers and television, it was hard to believe. The desecration of a flag that I personally fought for and put my life on the line, along with many other people. And here you are, carrying common flags. Uh, this, this really disturbed me uh, to uh, uh, really uh, bad, boiling points. He divided the public, and he was in some ways the worst possible leader that we could have had in the time of this great divisiveness, because that was Nixonian politics, to play to the divisiveness, to divide the body politic into them, and we. The we in that equation were the people the administration referred to as hard-working, tax-paying, patriotic Americans. Their enemies, the them were represented by the vociferous demonstrators who said they were patriots too, moved by conscience to oppose the war. In November of 1969, 700,000 of them came to Washington. I'm not sure, looking back, that uh, going to a rally like this was going to make any difference, but that was a time where there was an electricity in the air. Everybody's soul was was involved in it. Everybody's heart was involved in it. We felt that we had some input in the world and, and we could change the world. There was a revolution going on and we were all a part of it. I think the people were really fed up uh, with that crowd by the time we went into office. I think that... Um during the Nixon administration, Patrick Buchanan was a speechwriter for the president and the vice president. The silent majority was what we call middle America. It looked upon these kids as very privileged. Uh, they were going to college, and then they were behaving like that when the other kids were in Vietnam doing their duty. So it was more a sense of disgust and fed upness. And while a counterculture may have worshipped its rock stars, Vice President Agnew gave Middle America a hero of its own. But Agnew's role was the bayonet of the Republican Party and the tribune of the silent majority. Thank you very much. And he played that role extremely well. Thank you very much. The man who had been a joke in 1968, at the end of 69, was the third most admired man in America behind the president and Billy Graham. A spirit of national masochism prevails, encouraged by an effete core of impudent snobs who characterize themselves as intellectuals. Agnew's speeches delivered to enthusiastic audiences attacked everything from professors, students, and reporters to the counterculture's favorite music and movies. By the late 60s, everything was political. A popular recent movie, I won't name it here because I don't want to promote it, has as its heroes two men who are able to live a carefree life off the proceeds of illegal sales of drugs. No sympathy is wasted on the wrecked lives of the people who bought their drugs or financed our heroes' easy ride.
one of the big movies in this superheated time became a metaphor for the widening gap between the straight and the hip, the old and the young. Easy Rider. Oh, yeah. Easy Rider. Yeah, there we are. Ah, uh, well. Um, easy Rider. Yeah, well. Phew. Where do you want to start there? <laughs> that film was so extraordinarily unlike anything that had gone before its sense of really growing out of the culture. Uh, I'm not even trying to reflect the culture, but just being the culture. What the hell is this? Troublemakers? That had so much to say about the society, about the uh, becoming a society of two cultures along generational lines and other kinds of lines. Why don't you get a hat gut? That it was like getting hit in the gut by a fist. My idea was basically to talk about America, talk about the problems, and at that time, I felt that the country was going to explode. It, was ex it wasn't going to, it was exploding, and it was really happening. As the 60s came to a close, the violent and deadly backlash in Easy Rider was an eerie foreshadowing of real events to come. Cooperation with the armed forces of South Vietnam, attacks are being launched this week to clean out major enemy sanctuaries on the Cambodian Vietnam border. This is not an invasion of Cambodia. In May of 1970, when President Nixon announced that American troops were being sent into Cambodia, 350 college campuses erupted in violent protest. Nixon had been promising, we're getting out of it. And all of a sudden, here comes this invasion of Cambodia. Another country added to the list. It was just a shockwave around the nation. At Kent State University in Ohio, the ROTC building was firebombed. The governor called in the National Guard. Hunts and rocks were thrown. Before it was over, four college students were shot and killed. We represented a country gone mad. American troops shot down American students who were changing classes. That's the point we had gotten to. After the violence of Kent State, Polls found 58% of the respondents sided with the guardsmen, only 11% with the students. By order of President White, the university campus has been closed. Please return to your dormitories and leave the campus by the shortest route. The backlash of opinion against campus demonstrators would only grow. Following Kent State, some 75 colleges were closed down for the rest of the year. The cause, they said, was student unrest. Four days after Kent State, a massive demonstration in Lower Manhattan set off legions of hard hats whose rage had been building for years. It was never planned to explode, but it did explode. Well, I was on Water Street, and we all just headed towards uh, Broadway, and uh, all you could hear was just shouting and, and senses of, let's get the bastards and, and let's finish this once and for all. And there was some blood spilt. But it was all in anger, all in vengeance. Let's get them. And, and a lot of people, including myself, was was releasing the the hate and and the feelings that you had. Of course, a lot of us felt the uh, winners were very proud. Uh, we scattered the enemy. 
The hard hats were heroes for a few days, praised by Wall Street workers, given free coffee by area luncheonette owners. The leaders of the construction unions were invited to the White House where they presented President Nixon with an honorary hard hat. And the hard hat became a symbol for the so-called silent majority, those who felt their way of life was now under siege. By the early 1970s, it wasn't just anti-Vietnam protesters on the streets and on the news anymore, but a dizzying array of other forces as well. Women, Native Americans, Chicanos, Puerto Ricans, Black Panthers, Grey Panthers, the openly gay Pink Panthers. All these groups forged in this era of so-called identity politics were all militantly demanding their rights. The backlash against this politics of protest was just about ready to explode. An event in September of 1971 hastened the eruption. When 1,500 prison inmates rioted and demanded their rights, the nation's anger and frustration became focused on the Attica Correctional Facility in upstate New York. The inmates captured 50 hostages, took control of the prison's D-yard, and issued what they called five non-negotiable demands. Wait a minute, hold it. New York Times reporter Tom Wicker was one of the outside observers the inmates called on to help negotiate the non-negotiable. The Attica inmates revolted basically against uh, internal prison conditions, but the rhetoric of the revolt was very Marxist. You know, uh, the oppressed peoples of the world arise. The entire incident that has erupted here at Attica is a result of the unmitigated oppression brought by the racist administrative network of this prison. As this tense real-life drama unfolded, families of the hostages, desperate for word on the condition of their husbands or fathers or brothers, clustered around the prison. Would you take that? Would you take the mic out? They saw Black Panther leader Bobby Seale come to visit the inmates. They heard that North Vietnam offered the rioters asylum. Attica quickly became a symbol for all of America's boiling hatreds. I went outside the prison uh, to uh, report on what was happening inside. And all of a sudden there began to be these shouts and screams from the crowd. I hope they kill you all, that sort of thing. They identified us, the observers, with the, with the inmates. The tensions mounted as neither side seemed willing to make concessions, and the state ready to take the prison back by force. On the morning of the revolt's fourth day, prison officials did not let the observers back into D yard. Armed state troopers were perched on the prison walls. Everybody got a gas mask. And uh, certainly those uh, scared young troopers thought the inmates were going to kill the hostages. So they came in scared, and they came in shooting, and they came in taking no chances. The hostages are on the catwalk with knives at their throat. The four day standoff ended in nine minutes of mayhem. Helicopters dropped CS gas on D yard and state police marksmen opened fire, killing 29 inmates and 10 hostages. It's crazy, they didn't have to do that. If the state had just sat there, just sat there, for two more weeks, maybe three at the outside, I mean, those guys would have given up. What is it now, 20 odd years later? I can't get over that feeling. They didn't have to do that, you know. But they did. What happened at Attica was the largest and deadliest attack on Americans by other Americans since the Civil War. And in 1971, it often looked as though the country was in the middle of another civil war.
I'm just like a lot of, most of the guys I would say in Vietnam, I'm just going to do my time and get out of here if I can. I'm not here to win a war. I'm just here to do my time and rotate. How short am I? How much time do I have left? That's the biggest concern of everyone. And can I make it? The war was not going to be won. It was just going to be exited in the best possible political manner. And it was about dog-eat-dog -dog and surviving. Really a very brutal, prison-like existence of, uh, of survival. Inside, that really eats away at you. That has a, has a tremendous negative effect on your spirit and your, your sense of worth and your sense of purpose. You know, I was tired of all of it, weary of it. And too many deaths and too much pain and too much suffering. By 1970, American troops left in Vietnam felt the country was abandoning the war and them. The number of American ground forces had been cut in half as part of President Nixon's pledge to win peace with honor. As the pullout continued, new recruits, overwhelmingly draftees, felt they were being asked to fight a war already lost on the battlefield and despised at home. The enemy had no doubt about its purpose. Its only way out of the war was victory or death. Unlike American soldiers who came to Vietnam and they came only for one year and then got out, in Vietnam there was no draft period like a one or two years. So you would go on to the end of the day, to the end of the war. I wasn't doing. When you're fighting for home, you get down. As American ground forces were being cut back, air attacks were being stepped up in an effort to pound concessions out of the enemy. We had to rely on caves and tunnels and underground bunkers to defend us because the B-52 is a terrible high take. If you see half of the long bomb like this, then we know for sure that they would go to another place. But when you look up and you see a round bomb like this, it means that it's right on you. But continuous rounds of bombing and hundreds of thousands of casualties did little to deter an adversary continuously resupplied by China and the Soviet Union and able to recruit seemingly endless numbers of people. It is truly a national mobilization in that all people, men and women, young children, took part in the national effort of war. We saw an escalation of the anti-war movement all over the world. And even in America, we heard about the killing of the student in Kent State and uh, everything. The news from the anti-war movement all over the world gave us strength. Walt Kurtz, Tennessee, four Brian Stars. Right on. In America, by the early 70s, protesters against the war included some of the men who had fought in it once eager soldiers who now felt lied to and betrayed. I pray the time will forgive me and my brothers for what we did. And only I wasn't in Washington where they threw their medals. I thought I'd try to do one better and I sent my campaign ribbons to uh, President Nixon. I saw the war as, as completely unwinnable, which made it even worse, even more 
criminal, go on fighting a, a, a war that you know you can't and won't win. It struck me as, as worse than criminal, it struck me as insanity. As the war dragged on into the tenth year of American military involvement, there was still no end in sight. Vietnam had already brought down one president and was now threatening to bring down another. President Nixon standing in the polls dropped severely as the promise of peace with honor proved elusive. Peace talks in Paris with the North Vietnamese were stalled over the concept of mutual withdrawal and the release of American prisoners of war. Secret negotiations between National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger and Lee Dot To were not making any progress. But in February, of 1972, another set of secret negotiations did lead to one of the biggest diplomatic coups of the 20th century. In one stunning swoop, the Cold War politics of the post-war era changed. America was recognizing and dealing with the communists. Nixon was the great anti-communist. And to come on national television and announce that I've been invited to China and I've accepted with pleasure, it was astonishing. And you could tell by the reaction of the press. <laughs> White House aide Patrick Buchanan was on the trip the president called the week that changed the world. We have at times in the past been enemies. We have great differences today. He went to Beijing frankly, because he was trying to work the foreign policy game to get the United States out of Vietnam with honor. Nixon's aim was to have the Chinese pressure their North Vietnamese allies to come to terms at the peace table. And just four months after China, Richard Nixon became the first American president to visit Moscow, where he and Leonid Brezhnev signed the first strategic arms limitation treaty. The president got something else as well. He wanted Mao and Zhou Enlai in Beijing to have sleepless nights wondering what's Nixon talking to Brezhnev about over there in Moscow tonight. And he was a genius at this. And putting those tensions on which had the effect of blocking Soviet or Chinese getting together to present a united front against the United States in Vietnam. Nixon had taken a calculated chance and it had worked. The Soviet Union cared more about getting controls on American offensive missiles and preventing the Americans from broadening and thickening an anti-ballistic missile system than they did about their little allies in North Vietnam who were getting the living hell bombed out of them. And there was a, a sense of being betrayed, sold off, you know, at that time by the, by the superpowers. No longer able to depend on their powerful allies, the North Vietnamese appeared ready to make concessions at the peace talks. In October of 1972, there was an announcement from the National Security Advisor. We believe that peace is at hand. A month later, President Nixon, now seen as a seasoned world statesman, was re-elected in a landslide. But by December, peace was still not at hand. The North Vietnamese had left the negotiations, and President Nixon ordered the bombing of Hanoi and the port of Haiphong to force them back. For 11 days, American B-52s pounded Hanoi with 40,000 tons of bombs. Hanoi was in rubbles. The railroads, the bridges were all down. They had selected targets, obviously, and the U.S. knew where we were. And the only thing that happened in the POW camp was a piece of plaster fell down, and it hit one of the POWs in the head and cut his head. That's the only, the only uh, injury throughout that whole bombing. Bob Jones was in Hanoi during the Christmas bombings. He was one of 500 American prisoners of war held in a prison they called the Han. There was a, uh, a loudspeaker. Every morning and every afternoon, we had an English broadcast. The prisoners of war, whose release had become a crucial part of the peace negotiations, were scolded about the bombings by their captors. And Hanoi Hanna said, how can the United States continue with their bellicose and obdurate policies, bombing and strafing innocent women and children 
churches, hospitals, how can they do all that after they've placed a plaque on the moon saying we come in peace for all mankind? And everyone said, on the moon? And that was the first we knew about our moon landing. And there were cheers all the way through the camp. After that, we'd point to the guards, the guards would come up and we'd go, we'd point to the moon, you know, and say, U.S., U.S. For some prisoners of war, it was their seventh Christmas in captivity. At the end of 1972, there was still no guarantee that they'd ever get home. The end of America's longest war was met with no celebration in Times Square. No honking of horns on Main Street, USA. The day the peace agreement in Vietnam was signed went by like any other. People were prospering, the economy was booming, and most of the people didn't give a damn about Vietnam, whatever they say now, they really didn't. It was very despairing, a very rough years coming back from that war for most vets. I didn't feel like I fit or something. I wasn't the same person, that's for sure. I didn't feel like a civilian. Uh, it's hard to explain. I was very uncomfortable coming home, very uncomfortable. I'm on a civilian plane. I'm flying from Los Angeles to Newark nonstop. And a gentleman sat down, he was in a three-piece suit. And he had a briefcase and he kind of flipped down his tray and he was going through his briefcase. And we made small talk before we took off. You know, rain, I, yep, I see that. And where are you coming from? I told him Vietnam. And as soon as the sign came on that you were free to move around the cabin, he pushed the button for the stewardess. She came and he looked up at her and she, and she said, can I help you? And he said, yes, I need another seat on this airplane as far away from this gentleman as I can get. Returning vets often felt they represented a war that Americans wanted to forget. But if there was one moment that felt like a victory, it was the return of the American POWs. So we thought, well, you know, maybe you get your name in the paper, but nothing like uh, that it was. Uh, people everywhere we went that didn't know us, we didn't know them, uh, outpourings of emotion and uh, feelings, tears, uh, it was just uh, overwhelming, it really was. <laughs> President Nixon invited us to the White House for a, a party, a dinner and everything. So many believe we never could win. Our choices were grim. But you had faith in him. There was a lot of celebrities, and I remember uh, John Wayne was there, so we were uh, walking around talking with, with the Duke, you know, it was pretty, pretty cool. You're the best we have, and I'll ride off into the sunset with you anytime. It was, it was a grand time, it was fun, a lot of fun. It was the Nixon presidency at its peak. He had ended the war with honor. And the POWs were, um, were there at the White House. And Nixon was at 70%. It was really the apex, I think, of the Nixon administration. And within a month, of course, the Watergate uh, thing uh, ruptured and broke. The crisis in Vietnam would soon be replaced by a new crisis at home. A growing scandal stemming from a break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters in the office complex known as Watergate. 
Hearings on Watergate dragged one White House aide after another in front of Congress to answer questions about systematic wrongdoing in the highest office in the land. Watergate was certainly a fascinating spectacle. Suddenly, all the bad things the left had been saying throughout the Vietnam protests seemed to be proven true in spades. Well, Mr. Butterfield, will you stand? The televised hearings drew in an enormous audience. You swear the evidence that you shall give... This was the first time the American people had ever heard that a president of the United States did things like that. But I guarantee you, he knew what the predecessors had done. It didn't all start with Watergate. There was ample precedent for everything that Nixon did. Nixon got caught. There was one outrageous charge after another. Break-ins, spying on anti-war activists, punishing political enemies. In all of the millions of words of testimony, there is not the slightest suggestion that I had any knowledge of the planning for the Watergate break-in. Congressional committees and their battery of lawyers were bringing the charges closer to the Oval Office. One of the president's lawyers at the time was Leonard Garment. This was the show of the week, the bump, the year, the decade for young lawyers. Hello, young lawyers, wherever you are. And uh, they were drawn by the excitement of the, uh, of the pursuit of this, the great white whale, all these Ahabs. There was a constant pursuit by Congress and the press. It sometimes seemed the administration was coming unpinned. It looked that way in New Orleans when President Nixon shoved Press Secretary Ron Ziegler toward a horde of reporters. And Nixon was trying every which way. How could he save his presidency? How could he pin it on somebody else? How could he rationalize what happened? The Nixon White House was in, uh, at least from the external and even from the journalist's point of view, was in real shambles. They were paralyzed. I mean, they, they could do nothing but defend against Watergate. And in the middle of all that, the country was subjected to further signs of collapse. I will not resign if indicted. I will not resign if indicted. In October of 1973, Vice President Agnew, the administration's top spokesman for law and order, did resign after he was charged with extortion, bribery, and tax evasion in a separate scandal all his own. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. But even as his allies were falling around him, the President was determined to finish his watch. I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. Imagine a president of the United States uh, in a news conference on two national television saying, I'm not a crook. Uh, you know, you ne never even before that ever conceived that the, a president might be a crook. It just all began to mount up and ultimately it, it was a collapse. Good evening. This is the 37th I have spoken to you from this office where so many decisions... Finally, it was all too overwhelming even for the toughest of battle-scarred politicians. Each time. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. You could never take the presidency quite as seriously again. It maybe was purgative. It kind of... Ended, uh, ended that particular unhappy decade uh, to have Nixon resign and uh, the rather blank but benign figure of Jerry Ford take over. His resignation was a, a relief. Uh, casting off of an old uh, snakeskin, moving forward. In April of 1975, two years after American combat troops had left Vietnam, North Vietnamese forces reached the outskirts of Saigon, the South Vietnamese capital. An ally the United States had supported with men and material for nearly two decades was about to fall to the communists. It's almost like we were never there now. And uh, that's the tragedy of it, I think. On April the 29th, there were still more than a thousand American personnel in the city. 
They and 6,000 desperate South Vietnamese were helicoptered out as the last remnants of American power fled Saigon. Veteran Phil Caputo had returned to Vietnam as a reporter. And the North Vietnamese were shelling Tan Sinut Air Base. Oh, I remember uh, some of those shells landing close to them. I mean, the building was just trembling. And somebody said, go, go, go. And I remember running out and just leaping in this big CH-53 helicopter, huge thing. Come on, this way, hey, this way, come on. Come on, let's go. must have been 60, 70, maybe 80 Vietnamese refugees and a few American newsmen, a handful of people uh, from the embassy. And then the helicopter took off. I remember just looking down and just seeing this, the, this brown and green country. And then uh, we crossed the coast. The site I'll never forget, the 7th Fleet had mustered out there. They were going to take refugees out. I looked at all of this might, and I said, we got whipped by a bunch of peasant guerrillas in the end. On the next day, victorious North Vietnamese troops rolled into Saigon. At 10 o'clock in the morning, the radio announced that, you know, the South Vietnamese had surrendered. And and that was it, you know, we hugged one another and cried and... For me, it's a long, many long years. And now, we see the final day. I felt in a whole range, range of emotions. I mean, I felt sad, I felt regretful, I felt relieved that it was over. Maybe the one emotion I didn't feel was any sense of happiness or, or joy. I felt a sense of loss. Like it stays with you forever. Vietnam will be there until the day I join the, until I join the friends of mine who died before me. I think. They won't ever go away. For America, the fall of Vietnam would symbolize the end of an era, the post-war era of confidence, unity, and optimism. America had found that there were some burdens too great to bear, and some prices too steep to pay. The fall of Vietnam was the nadir of a humiliating episode in American history. The desire to begin again, to recover some sense of national purpose, would drive American life through the remaining years of the 1970s. That's on the next episode of the century, America's Time. And we hope you'll join us. I'm Peter Jennings.